Right, thanks, Zoe, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. I've been at Oxford Nano for, for, for about three years. We started when the map opened, and so we um, are part of the Greater Applications Group, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means and what we do. So Dan Turner built the Applications Group at Oxford Nanopore for the last six or seven years, and we're sort of divided into two major units now. So in Oxford, they do sample technology, so library prep and um, sample prep for both DNA and RNA, and the, um, the automation with Voltrex, and they do the informatics and the data analysis that comes with that. Um, that a lot of that is set up by David Stoddard, so if, you wanna, if you're curious about these things, go talk to him. In New York and San Francisco, we call ourselves genomic applications, and that's because we essentially work like customers do. We don't do any development on the core technology. We, don't, we just get devices and flow tools and kits shipped from Oxford, and then we try to do biological use cases and showcase the technology in the best possible way. Um, we now got a gridiron in, I think, September, October, August, September, and really our throughput has just gone up immensely, and we're just doing so much data development or getting so much data that we're now doing actually more bioinformatics and data analysis than we're actually doing lab work. Um, so all of apps, um, we are responsible for all these posters that you'll see out in the lobby area. Um, I'm, most of my talk today is going to be on these posters, so do go check them out. Um, also, there are some that I won't be able to talk about, so I'm just going to mention a few highlights here. When I talk about some, a project, you'll see, notice some pictures out here on the, on the right. And um, those are the people who are actually involved in this project. So go find them if you have any questions. But Voltrex has seen a lot of improvements lately. Um, everything from sample extraction to library prep, including PCR and DNA quantification, can now be done on Voltrex. Also, they've multiplexed um, four different samples on one cartridge, which allows you to do several preps at the same time. And they've done a whole genome amplification and library prep on the device to go straight onto the MinIon. So go check out that poster. Briefly, just what Nick was talking about, assembly, metagenomic assembly, we have a poster of each. We've been looking a lot, about, looking a lot at how we can get accuracy, what kind of accuracies you get in your assemblies based on what kind of reads you put into your assemblies. So 1D reads or 1D squared reads. So this will help you figure out what kind of reads you want to, you want to use for getting your assemblies done. And we've been looking at metagenomic assemblies, and we've been able to assemble bacteria from um, complex soil samples, which really um, lets you, yeah, pull, as, as Nick was talking about, let you pull out information. And even though we don't get full closed uh, assemblies, you can do functional characterization on these genomes. Right. What I really wanted to talk to you about was the project I actually started uh, about two years ago. And it's, um, it's a it involves, at that time, we couldn't really sequence whole human genomes very easily because we didn't have the throughput for it. So we thought, what can we do with something where we can have low coverage? And one thing that we were looking at is this pre-implantation genetic screening. So what this really is, is if people have, or if a couple has trouble getting pregnant and they go through the IVF route, they have the extra luxury of actually looking at the genomics of the embryos that they're producing before they implant them back into the uterus. So after a few days, you can take out a couple of cells and you can do DNA extraction and sequence it and you can actually get information about chromosomal abnormalities. Um, so that's being done currently. And also, if you want to go a bit further and do pre-implantation di uh, genetic diagnostics, you can do that on any kind of gene that you might be susceptible to having a SNPs in. So we've been looking at um, an exin, or ANXA5, which is involved in potential anticoagulation. And it's a very, if, if, if either of the parent has this, these SNPs, then the mother will be given daily um, shots of heparin throughout her pregnancy. But the fetus might not have inherited these SNPs, so there's really, you, there might be a lot of treatment that you can uh, avoid if you, if you could check the embryo before you plant, planted it back. So this is the, sort of the, um, the timeline for a normal IVF cycle. Um, the, the becoming, or the mother, or the expecting mother, or hopefully expecting mother, has a lot of hormone treatments. Her eggs are then collected, and the biopsy of the cells after fertilization are taken out. You then have to freeze down the embryo while you're doing your genomic testing. And then in the next cycle, the woman's next cycle, when she's been on hormones for another month, um, you can transfer the embryo back in after you've picked the embryo you thought was the best. And then hopefully she becomes pregnant and everything is fine. Um, but why would you want to do this with nanopores then? Well, one reason could be that um, instead of having to wait for your genetic tests to be done, you could actually sequence right after you've taken the cells out. You can do your prep re relatively fast, and then you can sequence the same day. And you can, without having to freeze down the embryo, you could uh, transfer it to the uterus the same, 
in the same cycle. So that would give you results faster, but also it would be, you, because you only have to sequence and as long as you, um, until you have the results that you're looking for, you could get a lower cost and do more samples at the same time, and you could have more control over the whole process because you can locally, um, you could have a MNI locally at every small clinic instead of having to ship single cells around the world to the core facilities. So we thought, Oh, so currently, the way this is done for any high-throughput sequencing method is that you, you, do, you take the cells out, you do the DNA extraction, you do the whole genome amplification, you sort of split the amplified DNA into two pools, and do PCR for the gene that you're interested in, and you do whole genome, or you just take the whole genome amplified DNA and then mix them all together, do the library prep, and then sequence. So we thought, actually, there's no need to split it all up. We can do it all in one... Um, in one pool, so we actually do our PCRs in the mix of the whole genome amplified DNA, and then we add on our sequencing adapters together with some barcodes, and we're ready to sequence. And what this does is that it allows you to do much fewer cycles of PCR, and um, it allows you to... Um, the PCR doesn't have to be specific for, the, for ANXA5 that we're interested in. It could be any kind of gene, and you could do uh, multiplex any genes that you're interested in, and you can uh, barcode each sample again so that you can sequence more samples on the same flow cell. So the, some of the results that we got are shown here. So um, this is called a, a joy plot. So this, if a normal, um, a normal female would have two of each of the, these chromosomes, and in this case there is an extra... Um, chromosome 16, which is not ideal, so the embryo you probably wouldn't use. The ANXA5 haplot the diplotype was homozygote, so that was a good thing. Um, the other example here, we have uh, a male, so you'd expect to have two of all chromosomes except the, the X and the Y, where you have one of each, but there's one less of both 15 and 16, so not an ideal embryo either, and also this is uh, diploid for the ANXA5 haplotype. So we did around 20 of these samples in collaboration with Simon Fischel at Care Facility, and um, we confirmed all of the haplotypes by capillary sequencing and all of the aneuploidies by array CGH. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And um, so it really, pro pro it really proved it to us that we can do these uh, experiments on aneuploidies, you can do them quite quickly. But another thing that we thought is how much do we actually need to sequence and how are we actually sequencing too much. So we did some downsampling of, our, of our, one of our samples and found that actually you only need 50,000 reads. And these are very short reads. They're 500 base pairs long. But 50,000 reads to, to robustly uh, qu um, call the aneuploidies. So 50,000 reads, that's only 500 bases long, it's actually only 25 megabases. And at 450 bases a second, and on around 500 pores, you can sequence the, one of these samples in less than five minutes. That really allows you to do a lot of samples on one flow cell. You can either multiplex then, or you can use the run until where you sequence and then stop when you have the results that you need and then go on to something else. Or when the cheaper fungal comes out, um, you, you might do one, as Gordon mentioned, you might do one test per one, f for one flow cell. What we also thought is that, well, if we can call these aneuploidies, we should also be able to call, um, without so much increase in coverage, we should be able to call smaller deletions or other translocations. Um, and some of these micro deletions and duplications are one to five megabases and not that big, but they really have consequences that are devastating. One that we chose to look at is called Credouchia syndrome, which is the deletion in the in chromosome 5. And infants that are born with this syndrome um, have high-pitched cries, they are intellectually disabled, they have microcephaly, hypotonia, and behavioral problems. So it's really something that you like to avoid if you're testing embryos anyway. So we sequenced a, the cell, a cell line from Credouchia syndrome, and this is the read depth plot that we got. And if you zoom in on the five, and then chromosome 5, you can see the deletion quite clearly. So for this, we did a mix of about 50-50% of sheer gDNA and whole genome, amplified gDNA, uh, whole, whole genome amplified DNA. And the coverage is 1.6x, so a bit more. Again, when we downsample, we found that with the sheer DNA, you can actually do with 0.07x and still pick up a deletion of this size. That's only 25,000 reads. Or if you want to whole genome amplify, you can do, which you'd have to in a, in a, in a PGS um, or PGD, you have 0.025x, or about 70,000 reads. So really, you, can, you don't need very much data to call these, these, um, these uh, lesions or insertions or whatever you have. Um, so this was sort of done at a low coverage, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit to talk about other structural variation where you might need a little bit higher coverage. Specifically, um, 
structure variation in human, there are a few different ones. We talk about inversions, deletions, duplications, and translocations. And um, some of them are not that long. There'd be a couple of thousand kilobases, but some of them are really long, so maybe up to over, but over 20 or 30,000 um, bases. And I think everyone who's here will appreciate that that's really difficult to find with short reads, and you need long reads to do that. So we chose to look at structural variation in the context of cancer, and more specifically, we chose lung cancer. Um, and we chose two different cell lines to look at, and one is the non-small cell lung cancer, or this is called 8441, and one is a small cell lung cancer, which is associated with smoking, and is called A549. And these cell lines have really messed up karyotypes. Um, this is, the cell lines themselves are heterogeneous, so this is an example of what it might look like. And so we sequence them to either 9.5x coverage or 15x coverage with sheer DNA, so not, not, not whale-like reads, but relatively long reads. And these are the read, depth, the read depth plots that we got. So as you can see, this is sort of the line that's, um, that would follow if there was, it was um, just two chromosomes of each. And something like, for instance, here, you have almost have three, three of all of your chromosomes, but you can also see in the karyotype here. So I know that Matt spent a lot of time actually looking at this and trying to confirm it with the karyotypes. And it's, it's not easy, but it looks like we have the sort of right thing. But we thought, let's be a little bit more specific about what we're calling. So we, made, we used the software called Sniffles. And for every um, structural variation that we found, um, we had it, at least five reads were supporting that structural variation. And so, these are translocations here in the middle, and as you can see, it's, the cell lines are just, there's just a lot of structural variation going on. Um, and we can, we're able to, um, to find um, the breakpoints at pretty high resolution. These are on posters outside, so if you want to go have a closer look to what, how this looks like, I would encourage you to go have a look at them outside. But what we thought, well, actually, these are, there are also SNPs present in these cell lines. So we thought we'd look at the KRAS gene and found that we could call the SNPs that have been reported for these specific cell lines. And we also found that we had higher coverage than we thought that we would expect for the coverage that we had found for the whole genome. And actually, there's a duplication in one of the cell lines. So that correlated with the number of extra reads that we saw. We're also generating data for the Human Genome Structural Variation Consortium to look at, to include nanopore reads in their data for, the, for looking at structural variation across all platforms. Okay, so let me shift gears to RNA-seq. Throughout the last year, we've done a lot of important work in RNA sequencing, and really, we have these three protocols that have been released recently that are, um, that are with customers now. So we have the direct RNA protocol, and then we have cDNA with and without PCR. And one of the important things that we saw is when you get long reads and you do RNA-seq, you really have much less bias than other platforms, so, or at least than Illumina. So here, everything that's in the blue, in sort of a blue box, is some sort of, o of Oxford nanopore RNA-seq, and the orange here is Illumina. And this is a yeast transcriptome, and we shipped out the, uh, to a core facility to do the Illumina sequencing. And what you see here is when you look at GC content, there's basically no bias in Oxford nanopore reads, whereas there is in Illumina reads. And if you look at read length, we do have a bit of bias, but not compared to Illumina. So the long reads are re is a really good way to look at RNA-seq. Another thing is if you look at how many reads you need to cover a transcriptome. So on the y-axis here, we have different transcripts and how, much, how many different transcripts you're seeing. And on the x-axis, we have the number of bases or the number of reads. Again, blue, Everything in blue is Oxford nanopore, and everything in orange is Illumina. So you can do with 50-fold fewer reads if you use the long nanopore reads to detect a certain amount of transcripts than you, can, than you need if you do um, Illumina. And of course, our reads are longer, so it makes sense that you can do with fewer. But if you look at how many bases you actually need, we, we do, you can do with seven-fold fewer. So what did we use it for? Well, we thought we'd look at bacterial transcriptomics. So we grew some E. coli cells, we extracted the RNA, and we uh, did the direct cDNA, so PCR-free cDNA, full length, and we did about 2.5 million reads of a stationary phase and a log phase. And this is another circus plot that shows the different expression levels. Um, if you go into a little bit more specifically, things that are involved in biosynthesis or secondary metabolites or uh, energy metabolism is uh, upregulated in the logarithmic phase, 
whereas things that are involved in biofilm or in quorum sensing is upregulated in the stationary, or in the, yes, in stationary phase, so that all kind of makes sense. Another thing that we did was look at long non-coding RNA. Um, so we collaborated with Biogacel, who had found a long non-coding RNA that had a cancer-killing phenotype, but they didn't know much about how this, what, how this look, looked like in either end, except a little bit in the middle. They had a little bit of the sequence in the middle. So we designed a series of semi-specific PCRs and um, to sort out what the 5' prime and the 3' prime end looked like. And the results that we got were a lot of different isoforms. We cover um, exons that, have, that are not present anywhere in the reference and isoforms that haven't been found before. And again, everything here is supported by at least five reads. I think one of the most important things about doing direct RNA is the same advantages that you do for doing direct DNA without any sort of amplification, and that's nucleic acid modifications. So nucleic acid modifications can arise in both DNA and RNA, and we know that happens all the time. I think we're still at the point where we don't know how important that they are, because there's been no really good way of method of detecting them. Um, we've shown before that when you run DNA or RNA through a nanopore, in this case it's RNA, um, we only base call and we only take into account the natural bases. And so, but the, because of the, the nature of nanopore sequencing, the signal will be shifted if there is some modification. And so we can see it in the raw signal. And so we recently added Marcus to the team, who's, been, who's known for having, made, or having written NanoRaw, and he has now written a new piece of software called Tombow which he will talk about in detail because I can't. He'll talk about it tomorrow at, uh, in a breakout session. You should really go listen to that if you're interested in epigenetics. Um, but what Tombow does is it detects uh, unnatural bases. And here, just have to show you one quick result. Um, oh, sorry. And that is if we, have, if we incorporate unnatural uh, bases into, or this, in this case, methylation, into a, into a bacterial genome at 25%, he can detect them around, in, around that uh, percentage. So Tombow is released now, and go see his talk if you're interested. And the future for applications, or at least genomic applications, is going to depend a lot about what kind of devices we have available. So with the, uh, with the fungal coming out, and Voltrex also, we should hopefully get one soon, and with Smidine, there's just a number of more things that we're going to get into. So I, today I talked about oncology and reproductive medicine, but really any of these things are things that we might, uh, that we might get into later on. So thank you for listening, and I'll take any questions that you might have. The floor. Can you see anyone? Is there a hand up there that we can't see? Okay, we'll take this one. So um, we've got a question from Dan here. What consensus accuracy did you work from to identify the oil structural variation in the cancer cell lines? I couldn't tell you. I don't think we actually calculated it. I mean, we we get the same sort of accuracies and error rates that everyone else would get. Um, we did some consensus accuracy calculations for our assemblies, but they're much, much higher coverage, and we get to 99.98. It sort of depends on the way you measure them as well. Um, I don't have a number for the structural variation work. Uh, but re really, for us, if a, if a read if a single read with the, whatever error profile that it has, if it binds to one bit and it binds to another bit and they're on two different um, chromosomes, then we can call a structural variation, especially if it happens more than once. So for us, for this type of project, it doesn't really matter to us what the error rate is. We have another question down here. How do you think looking at changes in expression levels under different growth conditions would change between the direct cDNA and direct RNA methods, if at all? Well, the hope is likely it wouldn't change a lot. Um, the, well, like, I think the real answer is we don't know. So we don't know what uh, reverse transcrip transcription does to a, um, I mean, if it works really well every time, or if it sometimes lacks, or if there's a secondary structure it can't get through. Or, so we, I think that the, re the answer is we don't know. We're looking into it. Uh, but the hope is that direct RNA would give you more precise expression level measurements. But I think the real answer is we don't know. Maybe tonight, when the RNA consortium are speaking, they'll tell us the answer to this question. We don't know yet. <laughs> Good trailer. Right, we've got a couple of questions. One, um, one at the front and one at the back. We'll start with the one at the front. Thank you. 
How easily to extract the DNA from the couple cells? And do you have a protocol to share? Then this one more, since you take a cell out, will affect the embryo development. Okay, so the first question, how do we extract? We had a very nice collaborator who extracted for us. We got the DNA after it was amplified. I am not aware of the protocol. I know that he used the Rubicon uh, kit to do the amplification. I'm not aware of what extraction they use. I know that they do just ship a couple of cells around the world at room temperature, so I assume that the cells are lies when they reach the core facility, but I don't know what they did for extraction. What was the second question? <laughs> just stranger. You take a cell out from the embryo. Yes. So we affect embryo development. So you, since you take out, maybe some cell is important for the human embryo development. So I think that is not the biggest worry. Uh, there might be a worry, I don't know. But the biggest worry is that what if you take out that one cell that has an euploidy, but the rest of the cells don't, then in that embryo, because it happens, you know, it happens at a cellular level. So that's called mosaicism. So you might actually be investigating that one cell that's bad and you don't use that embryo, or the other way around, you're investigating cells that are fine, but there's something going on in the embryo. You can't test the whole embryo. So this is as good as it gets. <laughs> okay, we've got one more at the back. I've actually been working with a lot of embryos, um, a whole bunch, but not using nanopore. And one of the big issues that we have faced is allele dropouts from the WGA process, uh, especially with Rubicon more than anything else. And that's, I'm just wondering that the data that you got, and when you're talking in terms of coverage, we never really were able to get a complete genome out of it. It's never, it seems very unlikely it would happen. So what is your data output on that? And the second portion of that question would be for PGD. If you aren't doing gene-specific amplification, how do you expect to apply that into the clinical setting if you're shooting blind, given that there will be allele dropouts? So I, for anything to having to do with assembly, we try not to amplify. So that's my sort of my, my answer for anything. If you want to do something that has to do with assembly, you want to do haplotyping and everything, don't amplify. Now, for PGS, you can't not amplify because it's three, one to three cells. We did, we did see a bit of um, an uneven distribution of the SNPs versus the, 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 the wild type, which may be due to some sort of amplification issue. We haven't investigated it to sort of higher level. I think you're gonna to have to optimize each, every single one of your individual genes before you can just start multiplexing. Obviously, you'd have to do that. I don't have a perfect answer. I, don't, I know that the whole genome amplification is not great. For, every, for anything else than this, we, we're working with another whole genome amplification kit, which is, I think study has put out, um, which gives you also slightly longer reads. I haven't done the investigations to see if it's better or not, but any time you do this type of amplification, especially this much amplification, it's a problem. I would recommend anyone to, to always sequence genomic DNA, if you can. Thank you. I think we've run out of time. So thank you very much, Cecil. No problem.